So here's a cool little fact. You can download the Japanese Famicom equivalent to the NES Entertainment System online service for Nintendo Switch from any console from any region for free. For free! And as a result, you get a catalog of Japanese games, including the art assets and regional differences for those games. And on one of my sleepless nights, I'm laying in bed and I decide to boot up Zelda 2. And right away, I notice a lot of differences between the version that I grew up with and the version that I'm playing in my hands right now. And I do mean literally right away. The second I stepped outside the temple, I saw that the water was moving, which was mind blowing to me because I've been playing this game for decades on the NES where the water doesn't move at all. So to immediately see something that is way off, piqued my curiosity even further. And with that said, welcome to the first episode of Region Break, a show where we're going to look at the differences between a US version and a version from a different region. And naturally, any version of a game that comes out of Japan has its very first difference with the packaging that it's presented in. Over in Japan, they used a disc system, usually came on these yellow discs here, and then packaged in a tiny jewel case similar to a cassette tape. Whereas in the US, we had cartridges and we used these giant freaking boxes that would dwarf the Famicom discs in comparison. But one thing that was really cool is that we had gold cartridges, a feature that Nintendo of America was so proud of that you could even see it through the box itself. All right, but anyways, to get inside the game itself, there are a ton of changes. So much so, in fact, that I've kind of broken this off into categories, as you can see here on the screen. And we're gonna start off with a topic that I think is pretty interesting and carries the trend of where we started with this video, and that is overworld sprites. But before we move on, I just want to say thank you so much for giving this new series idea a shot. And also thank you to the sponsor that is helping us through one of the worst fiscal months of the year for a YouTuber. That sponsor this time around is Raid Shadow Legends. You might have heard of them. Here's what Raid has to offer. They got over 500 champions to collect, each with their own skill trees and millions of artifacts to find and equip. And despite the fact that there's 500 of them, there are no two that will ever be the same. The level of customization that the game offers pretty much ensures a good amount of depth with a strategy that can be tailored to you. Character spotlight for me today is Sir Nicholas. Me and this character go way back, putting a vac man under my Christmas tree, and now he's a battle-hardened festive warrior. Whether you're new or old to the game, Raid just put out their biggest update yet. The event's called Doom Tower, and it's a giant tower of 120 floors, a bunch of secret challenge rooms, and 12 bosses you can take on. And to help everyone get started in the tower, the raid team is giving away a super special champion, Bulwark. He's very well tailored in clan boss, and he's an enormous help for people to decide to jump in. If you wanna get a head start in raid, all you have to do is hit the link in the description for your freed void champion, an XP booster, 50 gems, some energy refills, and even an ancient shard as soon as you get in the game. You'll find your extra rewards here in the inbox for the next 30 days only. Click the link in the description if you're finally ready to give raid a chance, or if you just want to come back and enjoy some of that new, new content. All right, so on the overworld map, there is one thing that is incredibly different between one version and another. You cannot escape how different it looks. It's the spirits versus the shadows in the NES version. As you're gonna see throughout this episode, players outside of Japan got spoiled with a lot of good changes. One of which being it's a clear indication what's a weak enemy, what's a strong enemy, and what's a fairy. Weak enemies are blobs, strong enemies are humanoid beings, and fairies are fairies. However, in the Japanese version, weak enemies are an off-white color, strong enemies are a purple color, and fairies are a red color, and they all share the shape of a specter, or a spirit. And then when I went to go back to collect more footage of this grave site that we're going to talk about later, I caught last second that the sprite used for Link riding on his raft is a completely different sprite used for the one in the US version. You gotta notice that some of these changes are made for an organic reason. In the Japanese version, Link is just kind of breaking the fourth wall and looking at the screen, whereas in the US version, Link is focused on his destination. And then there's the river devil. It seems that in the Japanese version, it was a literal devil that was blocking the player's path. And in case you didn't already know, playing the flute here causes the devil to stop guarding the river. However, in the US version, it's replaced with a giant spider. And the last major change that I could find on the overworld map was that the lava leading up to the final temple is moving. Similar to how it works with the water on this version, the game seems to make it very clear that you're walking on liquid, which I guess is kind of a good change at the end of the day, at least for the lava. And maybe the water not moving anymore in the US version is a byproduct of the developers realizing that it kind of doesn't make sense for Link to be walking on lava. And by removing the programming that animates the lava, it may also stop animating the water as well, and they just couldn't take the time to fix one and not the other. 
Now if we move on to mechanics, there are some really interesting balance changes to the game. There was one that completely caught me off guard and it's how the game levels you up. Now in the overseas version, you can level up attack, you can level up magic, you can level up health, but at a certain point it locks you into leveling up the other stats by making the other stats more expensive to level up. In the Japanese version, it's much different. You could totally max out attack without ever touching health or magic, but there is a huge consequence involved. In fact, I have a very genuine reaction from a live stream about exactly finding this out for the very first time. Oh, what the? <laughs> Wait a second. Where did all my level ups go? And essentially what is happening here is that when you die in the Japanese version of this game, whether it be attack, magic, or health, whatever is the lowest leveled stat is going to be what all levels revert back to after you die. What? 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 Also, you might have noticed that the game over screen is slightly different. And by slightly, I mean drastically. In the Japanese version, you get a black screen with the text that reads Return of Ganon, The End, followed by the sound of an elephant. <laughs> But in the US version, you get a much better looking screen that has the silhouette of Ganon and has a laugh that's more similar to a boxer from Punch-Out. Also, there's probably lots of changes to the functions of enemies, but it's very subtle and without resorting to the research of other people, I couldn't really notice. But there is one thing that was really interesting. The tech tights in this game require you to use the fireballs to kill them in the US version, but in the Japanese version, you can kill them with just the sword. I'm just gonna throw this in here because this doesn't really fit into any of the categories honestly. The one change to the spells menu is this one spell here called Reflect. In the Japanese version, I, I'm almost certain it was a mistake and they just fix it for the US release because they call it Reflex, which doesn't really make sense, but Reflect does. So I think it was someone on the staff who had English comprehension but maybe got the word wrong. Okay, now let's talk about items. There's not a lot of items that were changed from each game, but it's very interesting what the story is behind each. The trophy in the NES version has a slightly different sprite from the one that's used in the Famicom Disk System version, having its wings closed in a little bit and its arms not spread out. Seems like a really odd change, doesn't it? Well, we'll get to that in one second. And then there's also the Water of Life. For some reason, there's just two different bottles, and of course, you gotta ask yourself, why go for the trouble of changing the sprite of a bottle of water? Well, these two things have one thing in common. In the original Japanese version, there was a slight indication of religion tied to each item. The trophy originally being called a goddess statue, and the water of life originally being called holy water. And if I had to speculate as to why the sprites are different, it was possibly an unnecessary executive order to change the imagery of these two items to something unrelated to religious objects. And again, just strictly speculation, but then as a result, you just get two slightly altered items as per request of a chain of command. And then this last item that I have to show you here is one of the funniest things in this whole episode, and that is the kidnapped child. Now in the NES version, he's just a child with a red line across his shirt. And when you walk up to him, Link picks him up above his head like he would with any other item. Super ridiculous. But in the Famicom version, the child is in a little playpen. I think it's supposed to represent a small prison for the child, but it's so comically undersized, it doesn't really surprise me that they would change this. Especially the fact that since he is an item in the Famicom version and you can only stab items in this version, uh, well, it seems a bit unethical. All right, next up, let's do sound. And you might not think that this would be the most interesting topic, but I think you're gonna be surprised. So the very first thing I gotta mention, of course, is Horsehead. Your encounter with him in the Japanese version will greet you with this noise. Which I'll tell you something, that seems pretty cool. I wish that we had that in the US version. Volvagia also has the same sound effect, but I'll tell you, it makes me immediately more grateful that we don't have these sound effects when you hear how often it makes the noise. Go ahead and give it a listen. Now the battle start sound effect is different between the two versions. The Japanese version has a little diddly. Whereas the US version just has a sound effect. The sound when you unlock a door is different and also as an added bonus, if you pause whilst unlocking, you can hear the entire sound effect in full whereas it would be cut off early otherwise. So I don't have the best way of describing this, but in my opinion, when you use a spell in the Japanese version, it sounds a bit goopy.
Whereas this is how it sounds in the US version. The boss battle music loops a lot faster, which is something that I'm pretty thankful that is not the case in the US version. Again, this is a nice quality of life improvement that we got. I won't play both back to back because then you'll be here all day. But here's how it sounds in the Japanese version. Now this one's really funny. The, the chat dialogue sound effect is way more obnoxious in the Japanese version. US version sounds more like a typewriter, whereas in the Japanese version they sound more like aliens. <laughs> Here's one of the most surprising changes of all, and I will do a side-by-side -side comparison. The battle music that's played for non-boss battles. To try to find the similarities is a fool's errand. They are completely different songs. Here's a little refresher on how it sounds in the US. Here's how it sounds in the Japanese version. Alright, so now we'll move on to environment so that we can save the best for last. And the very first thing that is completely different in The Legend of Zelda 2 is Zelda's temple itself. In the Japanese version, the pillars sort of stopped right at the altar, and what was left was a low-hanging ceiling. But in the US version, the pillars keep going all the way till the exit. Not only that, but torches were added around Zelda as well. And something that is exclusive to the US version of the game, we had colored temples with different types of bricks. Whereas in Japan, everything was a little more uniform. The King's Tomb has one of the most bizarre changes. In the Japanese version, it was very dark and depressing and it had a bunch of enemies in it. But in the US version, it's daytime and it features an old woman that tells you about the grave. And then there's the church in this town here. The Christian cross at the top of the building was more generic in the Japanese version, but was altered for the US version. And then there's the barrier at the final temple. Now, I don't know why this is the case, the barrier is more multicolored, and the sound effects between the two barriers when they get dispelled are completely different. And then finally, there are action sprites. These are sprites for characters and enemies. And the first one that's been featured this entire episode, which makes me wonder if you caught it up to this point, is that Link doesn't seem to have a mouth in the Japanese version. They added a couple pixels so that he basically can have one in the US. And then this is a fun little fact, but we had three townspeople that the Japanese players never got to see. This includes the lanky man, the full-figured woman, and the little boy. And in certain areas of the US version where you might have seen the lanky man or whoever else, it gets swapped out with the smaller pool of villagers that the Japanese developers had to work with. Also, the wizards that teach you spells are more animated in the US version. Not only did their beard not move, but when they cast the spell, there's no animation for that, whereas in the US version, you can see this one frame of animation that was added. And now, let's talk about bosses. The whiz robe is a crazy change. In the Japanese version, he's sort of facing the screen, similar to the problem that the developers had with the raft. And so once again, they adjusted that sprite, so it looked like the whiz robe was facing Link instead. The boss Valvegia had a total overhaul. The body is no longer one giant sprite, but instead, a series of smaller sprites that are allowed to move independently. And the face was made to look less cartoonish cartoony and more menacingly. Then over here in the US for the 5th dungeon, we apparently had an all new boss named Guma. Whereas in the Japanese version, players would fight Helmet Head a second time. And that to me, I would say, is the biggest change of them all. I appreciate it. If you liked the video, it'd be great if you subscribed. And if you're already subscribed, I'm ready to announce over here that I'm doing live streams. So consider finding me over on Twitch so we can all hang out and have a good time. Anyways, thanks a lot guys. Take it easy.